What is going on guys? Welcome to this Python tutorial series for intermediates. In today's episode, we're going to talk about a concept which is actually not that intermediate. It's actually quite fundamental, but we haven't talked about it yet. The topic is called recursion. So recursion is basically the principle or the technique of a function calling itself. So when we have a function, my function or f1, and this function in some way calls itself, so in the code of f1, you'll see the calling of f1. This is called recursion, of course. This might lead to some problems because if a function f1 calls itself all the time, this creates an endless loop and creates the so-called stack overflow error, which the site stack overflow uh, got its name from. So you don't want to, you want to be a little bit uh, cautious when it comes to recursion, but it's a very effective uh, tool. It's very interesting and it's very important to know about it in programming. So let us get into the code. Now let us start with a quite simple example. We want to implement the ma mathematical factorial function. So the factorial function can be explained in two ways. In a non-recursive way would be you take a number, for example, 9, and to get the factorial of 9, so... Uh, this is the factorial of 9. To do that, you just take 9, multiply it by the next number that is smaller than 9, so 8. Then you, again, subtract, subtract 1 and multiply it. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, up until 1. And this would be the factorial value. So the result of this multiplication would be the factorial value. And this would be a non-recursive way of defining what factorial is. Uh, if I define it uh, recursively, what I do is I say 9 factorial is actually just 9 times 8 factorial. Uh, 8 factorial here. So because what you see here is 8 factorial, what you see here is 7 factorial, this here is 6 factorial, and so on. And 1, of course, is 1 factorial. Um, so I could define factorial or 9 factorial to be 9 times 8 factorial, but then I can define 8 to be 8 times 7 factorial. And this continues up until 1. So this would be the recursive way. And we're going to implement these two uh, ways of calculating the factorial value in Python right now uh, to show you the concept of recursion. So to start, let's just define a number n that we want to calculate the factorial value of. Uh, and to do that, we'll start with the factorial being 1. And then we say while n is uh, bigger than or greater than 0, so while n is at least 1, what we do is we say factorial equals uh, the factorial value times n. So the first one will be 1 times n, so it would just be 7 in this case. And then every time I decrease, let's do it like that, I decrease n by 1. So in the first iteration, we'll say, okay, 7 times 1. And then it will say, okay, now n is no longer 7, it is 6. And the next iteration it will say 7 times 6. Then it will say, okay, now it's not 6, it's 5. And then it will take the result of 7 times 6 multiplied by 5 until it reaches 1. And then we have the result. So I just have to print fact. And we will get the result of 7 factorial, in this case, 5040. Now this would be the non-recursive way. The recursive way would be to call the function or to define a function factorial factorial of a number and to call this number uh, or to call this function in itself. So to call the factorial function in the factorial function. Uh, to do this, I define an if else tree here and I say if n is uh, less than one, uh, less than one, I return one. So this is basically what happens when n reaches, uh, or as long as n, or not as long as, but if n is less than 1, I return 1 to define the last point, to define what happens when I reach the number less than 1. Otherwise, I just do the following thing. I say that the number <clears throat> that I want to return the result is just n times the factorial value of n minus 1. This is what I did in the definition initially. I said 9 factorial is just 9 times 8 factorial. And this is what we do here. We say n or n factorial is just n times n minus 1 factorial. So then I return this. And actually recursion is a little bit difficult to get your head around if you hear it for the first time. But you have to imagine if you start with 7, what happens is it goes in the L tree, of course, and then it says, okay, 
uh, the result is just 7 times factorial 6. And the problem is I never reach this point here because it goes immediately into the next function again. So I get into 6 here and it says, okay, 6 is 6 times factorial 5 and it goes in circles. It never reaches the return statement here until it gets to 1 because then we reach the number 1. Uh, and it returns it and then we get to 0 and 0 is actually just 1 because n is, uh, 0 is less than 1. It gets to this part here and it returns 1. And then finally we calculate it and it returns the final result, which would be 7 factorial in this case. So um, as I said, it might be a little bit confusing if you hear it for the first time. Just uh, to practice, just pick a number and uh, try to figure out what this algorithm does and why it does it. Uh, maybe you start with a number 3 or 4, a lower number, uh, because it's more understandable then. And to show you that it gives me the same result here, factorial of 7. We're just going to execute that, and you'll see we get the same result. So the one is recursive, and the one is non-recursive. Now one thing that's very important when it comes to recursion is to not think that recursion is necessarily faster or more effective than an iterative approach. And to show you that this is not always the case, I'm going to implement the Fibonacci sequence or basically a function that gives me the value of a Fibonacci number at some position. Uh, I'm going to implement this function in an iterative way and in a recursive way to show you that the recursive way is way, way slower and the iterative approach is way faster and more efficient. So um, for those of you who don't know what the Fibonacci sequence is, it's a sequence that starts with 0 and 1, and the next element is always the sum of the previous two elements. So 0 and 1 would be 1, 1 and 1 would be 2, 1 and 2 would be 3, 2 and 3 would be 5, and so on. And we want to have a function that tells us what is the value of the number at position 136, for example. And to do this in an iterative way, I just say def... Um, Fibonacci, and then I say A and B have the initial values of 0 and 1, so I say A is 0, B is 1, and then what I do is for x in range n, I say A, B equals B, A plus B. So what I'm doing here is I'm assigning the old value of B to the new value of A. And I'm assigning the sum of a and b to b. So imagine I have 1 and 2 here. 1 would be a, b would be 2. And now I say, okay, a is now the 2 and b becomes 1 plus 2, so 3. And now I would have a new a and a new b here. This is what we basically do. And then I say return a. So now I just print Fibonacci of 2, for example, and it will give me the Fibonacci number at the index 2. So in this case, Fibonacci is not defined, Fibonacci, uh -huh, of course I have a double N here instead of a double C. Okay, so 1 would be the value. 1 would be the Fibonacci number at the position 2, because it starts with 0 and 1. Um, Index 3 would be, or position 3 would be a 2, because that is the third number in the Fibonacci sequence. So it would be uh, 0, 1, 1, 2. And as you can see, I say 3, but it's actually position 4, because I'm referring to the index 3, so it's position 4. If I want to change that, I might do it like that. I think this should work. So n minus 1. Or actually, I don't think that this makes a... Oh, it makes a difference, yeah. So, because now it's always minus 1, so in this case it says position 3 is 1. Before that it says, uh, or it said, that the index 3 is 2, which both is right, but if I'm interested in the position, it's better that way. Now, to do this in a recursive way is a little bit different and not that effective, because in a recursive way I would have to say Fibonacci 2, I'm going to say right now. Again, I wrote it wrong, Fibonacci 2. And in this case, I just have to specify the rule what happens if Fibonacci is, or if the number is less or equal to 1. So I'm saying if n is less or equal to 1, just return a1. 
uh, or basically just return n because if it's zero, return uh, zero. If it's one, return one. Uh, and in all other cases, what I do is I say return uh, the Fibonacci number of n minus one plus the Fibonacci number of n minus two. So what I'm saying here is to calculate the value, I always call the Fibonacci function, actually Fibonacci two, sorry, the Fibonacci function on the number before that and the number two before that. So I'm calling it with every iteration, with every recursion, I'm calling the function twice. And you'll see that it still works, but I think uh, it will give me a different result for the same input because it does the same thing with the index and the position. Uh, but let's just see. So actually to get the same result, I have to keep this at n. So we're working with an index here. Uh, but you'll see it will always give me the same result. If I enter 30 here and 30 here, I will get the same result. As you can see. But you notice that it's not that much slower because we're dealing with, uh, with small numbers here. But let's say I pass, I don't know, 3000 here. If I pass 3000, the first function will be quite fast and calculate the value and the second one will take forever. If I run this, you'll see I get the uh, result here and I get a recursion error, which is actually called stack overflow error in other languages because I uh, use too many recursions. So let's pick a smaller number of a thousand to see the difference. And you'll see that I get the number here. And the other one, the recursive method, still works on the calculations. The problem is that with every time I call two functions. So in the first recursion, I call two functions. Then both these two functions call two functions. So now we have four then we have eight, then we have 16, 32, and so on. So it's an exponential uh, runtime complexity. It's, it takes forever, basically. So recursion is not always smarter, but it can be. So take care of that and think about if recursion makes sense in this case or not. So that's basically it about recursion. I hope you understood something. I hope you learned something. I hope these two example uh, examples helped you to understand how recursion works and uh, why it's useful. Uh, so thank you very much for watching and hit the like button if you like this video subscribe to this channel if you want to see more Feel free to ask questions and give feedback in the comment sections down below and thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video. Bye